to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ jesus said i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it matthew 16 verse number 18. we welcome you today to our second part in a series of lessons dealing with the differences in the lord's church what's unique about the church Jesus promised to build. What's different about the church you read about in the New Testament than we see in modern religious groups and denominations today? We hope that you'll get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to study this important subject together. And as always, today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit one of their assemblies on Sunday for their Bible class or worship or on Wednesday for Bible study. They'd be happy for you to come in and get to know them. You'll find people there who love God, who love the truth, and who are concerned about souls. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of God's Word and your desire to be a faithful follower of Jesus. We have a host of Bible study materials that will help you in your study of the Word of God. We have free DVDs and CDs as well as downloads that you can receive as well. Just log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com and you can access all our free Bible study material from our website. We'd even be glad to send it to you free of charge if that's the way you desire it. And friend, if you've got a question, you'd like to study the Bible further, please let us know. We'd be glad to help you in any way in your study of the Word of God. What is it that makes the Lord's Church so unique, different, and refreshing in a world filled with denominationalism today? Friend, the Lord's Church and its plea for unity is what makes it different. You know, so many people think that the Lord's Church wants to be exclusive and that, you know, we want to be singled out in that way. While, friend, we believe in the one church. Hear me well today. The Lord's Church has the biblical plea for unity based on the Scriptures and based on doing what God says. God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4, and members of the Lord's Church are pleading through the Bible for unity based on the Scripture among God's people today. Now, I know there are many who teach. You can just choose the church of your choice. And God's going to be okay with that. There are many roads to heaven and we're all just going down that same proverbial path. It's kind of like a buffet. You can pick and choose what you want and God's going to be okay with that. So many people have the, the, the Burger King philosophy when it comes to religion. You can have it your own way. Well, friend, that's not God's way. The Bible does not say just choose the church of your choice. The Bible does not say there are many roads. The Bible says there's one way. Uh, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. And friend, I'll assure you, the Burger King philosophy is not God's way. Just have it your way is not the way God wants it to be. People tried that at one time. Uh, in the book of Judges, they tried that, man doing it according to his own way. And God was not at all pleased with that. And so let's think about the biblical plea for unity. Friend, the Bible teaches that we all ought to strive to be one. Psalm 133 and verse 1, the Bible says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Does God want unity? Absolutely He does. Does Jesus want unity? You bet. John 17, verse 20 and 21, Jesus prayed to the Father, I pray that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. God wants unity. Christ wants unity. And friend, I will assure you, members of the Lord's church are pleading for biblical unity. Unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 3. The real question is not whether we want unity. 
But how is unity going to be obtained? And friend, the Bible teaches for us to have unity, we've got to have it on God's terms. Not what I think, not what you feel, not just saying, hey, let's just accept everybody like they are, regardless of what they believe or how they act. I mean, you've got people today who are promoting unity and diversity. There's one person who's teaching, this is the only way to be saved. There's another person teaching, this is how you've got to be saved. And then there are people in the middle saying, although those people are diametrically opposed to what they teach, hey, we can all have a big bear hug and be okay about it. Well, friend, is that the way the Bible teaches it? That's not unity. That's not, that doesn't even make good common sense. How do we have real unity? By going to the Bible and all doing what God says is how we have unity. Friend, the Bible clearly teaches if we're going to have unity, it has to be based off the things God unites us on. What are those things? Let me read them to you. In Ephesians chapter 4, I want you to hear how today we can have unity based on the seven ones, the seven unifiers that God gives in Ephesians 4, beginning in verse number 4. Listen to these words. The Bible says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. How are we going to have unity? When we recognize there's just one God. Buddha's not God. Uh, there are not other gods. Uh, the foreign gods today, those are not real gods. There's only one God today, the God of the Bible. There's only one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Revelation 19, verse 16. There's only one faith. The faith that was once for all delivered in the Bible. Jude verse 3. Many of the priests were obedient to the faith in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 6 verse number 7. And so there's not a multiplicity of faiths and we all got different faiths and we're all... No. The Bible says there's one faith. One Lord, one faith, one God, one baptism. That's different. That's unique about the church. We teach that baptism according to the scriptures is by immersion only. Romans 6, verses 1 through 4, it is a burial in water. We teach that baptism, according to the Bible, is for the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38, we teach that a man's got to understand that. John 8, 32, you've got to know the truth. You've got to be of accountable age to know the truth before that means anything to the individual. And so one Lord, one faith, one God, one baptism, one hope, and one body. What is the body? Friend, how are people today going to be united? Denominationalism's not going to do it. Denominationalism, by its very nature, is divisive. It's not promoting unity. If we want to have unity, we want to be a part of the one body. So what do you mean one body? Well, here's what the one body is. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23 says, And He, Jesus, is the head of the church, which is His body. Well, what's the body? The body's the church. How many churches are there? Just one. There was only ever intended to be one church. The church that Jesus built, the church that wears His name, that wears the name of God, and honors the biblical pattern. And so if we're going to have a real plea for unity, it's got to be based off of the seven unifiers that we see in Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 7. If we're going to have unity, it's got to be based on the Bible as the complete roadmap and guide to heaven. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Jesus and His Word is the only way to get to the Father. Yeah, there are two paths, but I assure you, you only go, want to go down one of them. There's a, a broad path and a wide way and most people are going down it, Jesus said, that leads to eternal destruction. Then there is a, a narrow or a restricted path, and few there are that find it, Jesus said. And that's the way that leads to eternal life. And may we be encouraged then to let our plea for unity be based on real unity, found in the Bible and found in God's plan of salvation. But friend, we also notice that the Lord's church is, is different, is unique, is refreshing in a world of denominationalism because the music that you will find in the Lord's church is different. Now, to most people, 
One of the most obvious differences when they attend the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ, is that we have a cappella singing. Churches of the Lord, churches of Christ, do not use instrumental music in praising God. Well, someone says, why don't you use instrumental music? This is not really the question. The real question is, where's the authority in the New Testament to use mechanical instruments music? Remember, we've said the Bible's our guide. Today, we're going to be judged by the words of Christ, John 12, 48. I am living under the new covenant of our Lord and Savior, that being found in Matthew through Revelation. Where's the authority in the New Testament, which is our guide and our law today, for mechanical instruments of music? Well, friend, there's not one reference in all the New Testament to the church in worship today here on the earth using instruments. Everything the Bible says about music is about singing. Romans 15, 9, we'll sing in the assembly. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Singing and admonishing, teaching one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing again and making melody to the Lord. Hebrews 2, 12, James 5, 13, uh, is anyone happy? Let him sing. I'll sing with the Spirit. I'll sing with the understanding. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. Acts 16, 25. Paul and Silas are singing and praying to God and the prisoners are listening to them. Matthew 26, 30. Jesus and His disciples sang a hymn and went out. Friend, those are the New Testament passages that have to deal with music. And, and none of those authorize us to use mechanical instruments of music. Somebody says, okay, well, why would they have to? Well, think about this with me. The Bible teaches that Christians are to do that for which they are authorized. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6, Paul said he transferred some things to himself and Apollos for the Christians in Corinth's sake that they may learn in us not to think beyond what's written. The Bible says in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, we're not to add to, nor to take away. We're only to do what God says. Friend, if the Bible is our guide, and we're to only go by the Bible, and in the New Testament we're never told to use mechanical instruments of music, then where's the authority for them? Christians are commanded to sing. We're commanded to make melody in our heart. We're commanded to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's the way God's told us to do it. If that's what God wants, then we need to honor and recognize that. Where are you going to find a piano? A 10-piece rock band, a drum, an electric guitar. Where are you going to find all that in the New Testament? Well, friend, it's absent. God said, sing. And he told us to make melody in our heart as we sing and as we understand that which is being said with the words. And so the music is different because we simply want to go by what the Bible says. Friend, another difference in the Lord's church, the church you read about in the New Testament, is our weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. In a lot of places today, they might observe the Lord's Supper maybe on Christmas, maybe on Easter. Some will observe it quarterly. The real question we're asking is, what does the Bible say about how often Christians should partake of the Lord's Supper? Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. He took that, that bread, this is my body which is broken for you, as often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. He took that fruit of the vine. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you. As often as you drink, do this in remembrance of me. Friend, there is um, there's a significance in what's said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26. As Paul taught about the Lord's Supper, he said we're to, as often as we do this, we're this often until the Lord comes. This is something that was to continue as often as we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And thus, this was a continual observance until the Lord comes and until the world comes to an end. But how often are Christians to observe the Lord's Supper? Friend, I want you to think about some principles with me that we find in the Bible. The Bible says in Acts chapter 20, verse number 7, that Christians gathered 
on the first day of the week to break bread. Look at this passage with me. You want to see how, you know, we're asking ourselves, what did the church in the Bible do? What do New, New Testament Christians do? How can we follow their pattern? Would you look with me in Acts chapter 20 and let's see what Christians then did and see our pattern today as well. Look in Acts chapter 20. I want you to notice what verse number 7 says. The Bible says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to part the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. When did Christians, when were they coming together here? On the first day of the week, Sunday being the first day of the week. That's why we symbol on that day. Jesus was raised on the first day of the week. Things like unto that have a great significance there. But because God told us to, we come together on the first day of the week. Now, why did they come together? Now, on the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. That's a phraseology in the New Testament of taking the Lord's Supper. It's used in Acts 2, it's used in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, other places as well. They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Now, is there any special week here? Any specific week he's talking about? No. Every week has a first day. Christians are commanded to come together on the first day of every week. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. What's the purpose of their coming together? to break bread. If I'm commanded to come together on the first day of every week, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and if Christians here came together for the purpose of breaking bread, then friend, we find authority in the Bible for Christians to remember the Lord's death and His sacrifice every first day of the week. I want you to think about this. In Exodus chapter 20, verse number 8, here's what God said. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Now, what did God mean there? All God said was remember the Sabbath. Uh, we're to come together on the first day of the week. God said for them, remember the Sabbath. What Sabbath? Uh, how often on the Sabbath? When God told them to remember the Sabbath, they interpreted that correctly by remembering every Sabbath day of every week. Friend, the language is very similar in Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. You see, the first day of the week was in, when Jesus was raised. Matthew 28, verse 1. It's that day Jesus ascended back to the Father. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. And it's what Christians are taught by the example of the New Testament to remember as well. You know, another difference that we find with the Lord's church is its teaching on salvation. Friend, I realize that there are various and diverse teachings on salvation among men today. Some will say that God elected us and with no action of ours, we're saved. Uh, others say that man cannot be saved. Some are elected to salvation. Some are elected to be lost. Uh, others teach that all you've got to do to be saved is believe in Jesus. Some will say that all you've got to do is say the sinner's prayer. Others say that you've got to take a baby and baptize him when he's first born to save him. Well, friend, all we're asking today is, what does the Bible teach about salvation? Friend, the Lord's church is unique and refreshing because when we ask the question of Acts 16, verse 30 and 31, what must I do to be saved? We're going to go to the Bible and let it tell us what to do to be saved. Friend, to be saved, there's no doubt. You've got to hear the message about Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. Faith is essential according to Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, we can't please God. Therefore, whatever way I get faith is also essential. I get faith by hearing the Word of God. And so to be saved, I've got to hear the message of salvation found in the Bible. To be saved, the Bible teaches, I must believe in Jesus. Unless you believe that I am He, Jesus said, you'll surely die in your sins. But belief alone is not all that we've got to do. James said we're not saved by faith alone. James chapter 2, verse number 24. Oh, belief's essential, but there's other things I've got to do as well to be saved. I must also, once I've heard the word and believed in Jesus, I must repent of sin. Peter said, or Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 5. Repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out, Peter said in Acts 3, verse 19. And so once I've heard the message, 
Uh, I'm committed to the fact that Jesus is the Savior of the world. I'm, I'm willing to turn from sin and turn to God and strive to live the life God wants me to. The Bible teaches I must also make the good confession that Jesus is the Savior. With the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Like the Ethiopian eunuch, I need to say with my mouth, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, friend, the Bible teaches to be saved, I must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Here's what Peter said so clearly in 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Peter said, Baptism does now also save us. Friend, why would anybody want to say baptism doesn't save? If the Bible explicitly says, baptism does now also save us. Why would anyone want to say baptism's not essential if Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved? Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. And then, of course, Christians teach that if we're going to be saved, we've got to be faithful unto death, Revelation 2, verse 10, and we must walk in a newness of life, Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. And then one final, final principle is this. We know that the Lord's church is unique among uh, religious groups today and denominations. It's different because what we teach about the security of the believer is different. What we mean by that is this. There are a lot of people who will say that once you're saved, you can never be lost. Many teach once you're saved, you can never go to hell. This doctrine is known as once saved, always saved. The, the security of the believer kind of is the idea. Friend, this doctrine teaches that you can never, ever fall from grace. But as we look to the Bible, there are too many clear-cut passages that teach that's just not true. The Bible teaches one can fall from grace after being saved and be lost. God doesn't want him to. We don't want Christians to. Nobody wants to themselves. But it is a possibility. Now, let me give you some examples of that. I want to give you, first of all, the clearest example ever to show that a person can be saved and then be lost even almost immediately after that. Look in your Bible in Acts chapter 8, and I want to show you an example of this. Acts chapter 8, verse 13. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and the signs which are done. Simon the sorcerer in his former life has been a con artist or a trickster. He's been performing what people believe were signs or miracles, but he knows they weren't because when he eventually sees a bona fide miracle, he makes an error that's going to eventually cost him his soul if he doesn't repent. But here's what I want you to see. In verse 13, Simon hears the message. Simon is baptized. He obeys that by a, an apostle of the Lord. And the Bible says he becomes a follower of Christ. Now, here's what I want you to notice. Now, Simon is going to almost immediately after becoming a Christian fall into sin. Acts 8, 18, Simon sees that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the power of the Holy Spirit is given. Simon, who kind of reverts back to his old lifestyle, says, I'll give you money if you give me this power also. And I want you to notice from the Scripture what Peter says to this man who just became a Christian. Look in Acts chapter 8, verse number 20. But Peter said to him, don't miss this, your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God if you purchased the money you've got neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God repent therefore of this with your wickedness and pray to God if perhaps the thought of your heart might be forgiven you friend here's what we learn from this passage Simon just obeyed the gospel. He reverted back to his old life. He went into a life of sin again. And Peter said this to him. Don't miss this. Your money perish, uh-oh, with you. Simon fell back into a state where he was going to perish spiritually. What does that passage teach me? It is the clearest example ever to show that a person can become a Christian, can so sin as to be in a state where they're going to perish spiritually. 
Now, that's not the only passage. There are a host of them in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, Paul said to Christians who are trying to go back to the old law, you who try to be justified by law, you have become severed from Christ. Listen to this now. You have fallen literally out of grace. Now here's what men say. This is what's amazing about the Bible. This is what's refreshing about the New Testament church. Men say you can't fall from grace and in almost the exact language of false teachers, God said to Christians who are trying to go back into the old way, you have fallen from grace. Again, Revelation 3, 5, you can have your names written out of the book of life. 2 Peter 1, verse 10, be more diligent to make your calling an election sure. Why do I need to be faithful unto death if I can never be saved or I can never be lost? And so we learn from the Bible that a person can so sin after being saved as to be lost. That's not what a lot of people teach. But friend, that's what the New Testament teaches and that's what makes the Lord's church unique. And so as we think about these things today with you, all we ask is that you get your Bible, get your New Testament, Study the Scripture. See for yourself if these things are true. If they're true, we're not asking you to obey them because we said so. Simply obey them because God said so. Search for yourself and make sure that what you're doing is in accord with the Word of God. We just simply want to be Christians, followers of the Bible. Our heart's desire is to just simply do what God says, to be Christians, nothing more, Nothing less. No, no hyphenations, no men's names attached to that. We just want to be followers of Christ and followers of the New Testament. If you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, we're begging you to do that today. If you're not a child of God, why not become one? Know today that the God of heaven loves you deeply. That Christians are, are waiting for, are encouraging you, and are praying that you'll become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may each of us live our life in such a way that one day we can hear these words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. May God help us to strive to hear those words on that great day. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.